Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is episode number 66B, the answer in my What is a Mystery Tools series. And a couple announcements here. First of all, many people seem to like this feature, so I'm going to continue with it by popular demand, which means 50 people ask for it. But uh, as long as I have plenty of good items, so it will be infrequent when I do it. So, But do watch for those. So in a minute here, I'm going to give you the answers to this. But, and I think these are interesting items, and some of you wonder why I don't include the answers right at the end of the first video. Well, because I don't know what all the items are, and I'm waiting for your input on some of them. And, in other words, the answer, but I will put the answer just one week away rather than hanging on for one month or so, which I have been doing in the past. But let me show you where I got my inspiration for this feature. When I was a boy, I used to read Popular Science and Popular Mechanics, and sometimes they would have feature articles on what is it, or guessing the grills or dashboards of cars, and I always liked that type of thing. But more lately, I got some of my inspiration from the Farm Collector, where every month in this magazine, they have a feature called, what is it here, Mystery Tools. So there are the tools they're trying to get an answer for, and then they show on this page the answers for the previous month. So you have to wait a full month, but there's always real neat items in this magazine. This is 10 years old. I don't know if they still print this. Similarly, most of you know that I'm a member of Midwest Tool Club Association, and this is the recent magazine, uh, June of 2021, actually it's three months old, but they also have an, a feature called What's It? And they're asking the answers to these items, and then they are like the other magazine in that the answers from the previous month appear here at the bottom. Item number one, and I was again shocked by how many people knew exactly what this is or was, and someone, Joe Scarborough, to be exact, sent me the patent drawing because I could not find it using these numbers. And this is a General Motors tool used at EMD, that's Electro Electromotive Division, where they make the big locomotives. And I'll show you the patent now. Okay, here's the patent drawing, and you can refer to that patent number. I'll show you a close-up near the end of the video with the actual number, so you can read it if you want to look that up and study it. But it is assigned to General Motors. So what does it do, you're asking? Well, here is a drawing that someone sent me. Chris, and his last initial is D, thank you. And this is a very, very large piston and liner. And the tool is used to remove this snap ring or retaining ring that allows you, I guess, to get the piston out of the liner. So that's all it does, but pretty darn important tool if you're working on locomotives. Okay, this is item two, and I have it mounted on a 12-inch Craftsman Atlas lathe. It is a wheel dresser. There's the diamond nib, and I have the Do More grinder mounted right here, so you can see how it's used. And this clamps right to the bed. Remember that the Atlas lathe does not have V-ways, so it's very rigid and sturdy. In fact, I made a video on how to use it. It is not published. It will be published near the end of September 2021, but let me show you that so that you can watch for it. And this is the title of the video, Dressing the Wheel on the Atlas Lee. That's number 749. When available, watch it. I hope you will like it. Okay, when Walter sent this to me, I really didn't know what it was, but I did guess, and I was correct in my own series, that it is a device for undercutting the mica 
on commutators of armatures. Now that's something I've been doing since I was 16 years old. We had generators and starters. We were working on them all the time when we were kids, it seemed like, teenagers. And I would turn the commutator on my dad's South Bend lathe, and then he showed me how to undercut the mica. And I just did it by hand using a hacksaw blade. I did not know there were devices for it. And this is a rather primitive device compared to some that are powered with a tiny little cutting wheel. This is strictly hand. And of all things, this is a snap-on item. So I'm going to show you the picture out of the 1955 catalog. Joe Scarborough sent it to me at the snap-on catalog. And then the description in the catalog. And then I'll show you how this actually works. I might have already said it, but Joe Scarborough sent me these pictures, and this is out of the catalog, and there you can see it in use, and one of the advantages to this was that you could leave the end bell or the pulley on. You did not have to disassemble everything, so you could make quick work of it, and it's held in a bench vise while you use it. Now let's take a look at the catalog description. As I told you, there is a patent number on the casting, but it is not legible. So I'm glad that Joe filled me in as to what this thing is, and I'll let you read this at your leisure. There'll be a still picture of it at the end as well. But it's a rather crude item considering it's snap-on. I wonder if it's still under warranty. Okay, it's clamped securely in the vise, and notice that it's adjustable for different length armatures. So I've got it set for this one. I think this was out of a Farmall generator. Not totally sure. I don't remember. Now, you can buy cutters for this, or you used to be able to, but this one, if it is the correct one, and I don't think it is, does not have teeth on it. So I'm not sure exactly how it would cut. But the idea here is that you can rotate this from segment to segment, and I'm not really going to tell you why we undercut you can look that up if you want, but it's always done after you turn the commutator. But the whole idea here is that the little cutter can be lined up with the mica. Mica is the material between the copper, and it's very hard and will wear your brushes out if it isn't undercut. And then you just go back and forth like this. Now this isn't really moving any material, so I don't think it's the right cutter. But it certainly gives you the general general idea. And this is spring-loaded. There's a spring like a mousetrap in here. But a very heavy one. And I put this screw in. That was not in there. It will raise and lower this to adjust the pressure. Then you would rotate it to the next segment. And undercut that. And so on ad infinitum. Hope you like this. Okay, everyone, and I do mean everyone, knew what this was, sent to me by Russ McClenning. And they are shims. Now, don't confuse these. There are different thicknesses here. With smaller shims that were used to adjust the front end alignment on some cars. Also, I remember on old Chevys or some cars that I had, much smaller ones under the hood that adjusted the fenders or doors or something at the factory because the quality was so poor they had to shim them. But these shims are much larger and used for uh, aligning machinery typically by millwrights. And you know what? Several people read this, I think, and cheated because I didn't have it all covered. I meant to, but this is a McMaster car item. I'll zoom in on that. They still sell these. And you can buy replacement shims, and I bet these are very expensive. Well, how do you use them? What they're for, you ask? I am using this Sergeant Welch teaching aid here to show you how they're used. And this is a little motor and a little generator that could be used in a school to show kids how they work. But now visualize a much larger one, a huge Caterpillar general, a generator set, or uh, an engine powering uh, pumps or something like that in a mill or a factory. These two shafts, one, two, have to be aligned very accurately to prevent wear. Here they just use a rubber tube 
and these can be tilted but the caterpillar will not but they use the shims right here between the bolts you see there's slots in the shims for the bolts and you can raise to any amount you want using the, the correct stack of shims to bring this piece in alignment with this one so that's what they're for hope you like that now let's get on to the extra credit if you will okay here's extra credit and that is a primitive air conditioner sometimes called a swamp cooler or an evaporative cooler you put ice or water I think water I don't know if ice would fit in there no one told me exactly they work a little bit in real dry climates worthless in damp climates like the Midwest here I wanted my dad to buy one but he knew better many companies made these this was probably the most popular Coolmatic and by the way some people cheated on me and <laughs> blew up this little part in the picture so they could see what it was because everybody seemed to know what this was I, that kind of surprised me too which actually shows you the uh, age, average age of my audience, notice that it says patent pending, which always to me means that it's probably worthless. I tried to find the patent and I could not. Sears sold them and probably Western Tire and, and all of the companies. And this was really before we had cooling by refrigeration at a popular price anyway. Let me show you what they say about this in Wikipedia, I believe it is. This is what Wikipedia has to say about it under car cooler and there it is on a looks like a 49 or a 50 Chevy along with that visor so that guy's really cool in three different ways isn't he so look that up if you are interested often you see these at car shows mounted on cars of that era now let me sh read the description for you Okay, I went to the effort of printing this out, but I don't believe you're going to be able to read about it. And it's all about the Coolomatic. And you can do a search on that if you want to and see if you can figure that out. All right, that about covers it, but stick around. I have two other things under extra credit that I want to talk about or show you. Thanks for watching. By the time you watch this video, I will have sold this little number two Stanley Plain and I'm documenting this for myself so I can reminisce and look back on it but a number two is semi-rare and it's only a little over oh it's seven inches long I suppose but there's even a smaller one a number one which it was about useless and they must not have made many of them but it's extremely rare but compare it to the most popular side a number five there also was a four four and a half three and so on but it's it's really a neat little plane and this is an older one because it does not have the frog adjustment and notice that it's about the size of what my dad always called a little block plane this is a low angle I used to have quite a collection of planes when I was in my natural prime now one more thing Joe Stefano sent this to me and I'm not going to talk about it much other than to give him credit because I've already shown one of these in my video and it was sent to me several years ago by my girlfriend Sarah remember that so the, this one is missing the blade and the spring and you see the spring is broken off right there these were made by Wiss do you rem remember what they were for Yes, for making buttonholes, for instance, in a leather vest. Different lengths, depending on the brass anvil. So, thank you again to Joel for sending that to me. Well, this completes a video that was going to take four minutes, and I think it ran about 14 minutes so sorry no I'm not sorry about it you can turn it most people do turn it off on a, on a 10 minute video the average viewer time is four minutes well rather than whine about it anymore this is Mr. Pete saying so long for now and I'll see you next time be sure and search my videos because not all of you are getting 
the bell warning on that. Something is wrong in Denmark. 